Yeah. Okay. Hello and welcome to another Media Snack Meets. Uh, this episode, I am joined by author of The Choice Factory, Richard Chotton. Hello, uh, I'm Richard Chotton. I wrote the book The Choice Factory and I'm Head of Behavioural Science at Manning Gottlieb. Brilliant. Uh, well, it's a welcome. Richard has been very kind and you've just done a session with the team here at IDcoms and taken us through, uh, and I saw you do this in New York as well, which is part of, it's kind of this is part of your book tour, yeah. right? But sharing some of the ideas around the book. Uh, if you haven't seen this, you should go and check it out. It's, it's so snackable and very inspiring. But what, what is it about? Behavioral science. Yeah, so it's what a book. Um, so behavioral science is often another word we use for social psychology. So it's the study of why people make the decisions they do. Yeah. Uh, and it's based on a 120 year history of psychological experiments written by a load of academics around the world. And it's organized in these like bias, so what, what's a, tell us what a bias is. So, so the, the, the premise of the book is it, it follows a, a single person through the day, they make 25 decisions like should I buy a red wine or a white wine, should I give money to a beggar or, yeah. or, or not. Each of, those bi um, each of those choices, I explain why the person did it with reference to what's known as a bias. I look at, quickly look at the academic evidence for that, mm -hmm. then some experiments that I've done that show that it does relate to commercial brands now. Yeah. And then the most important book, so the majority of each chapter is, look, now you know this as a marketer, what should you do differently? What should you practically do yeah. differently? And I think that's, it's, you don't have to be in marketing to read it, right? Because it's, it's just quite interesting. It's all based on like historical research or you know, some of the examples of you know, famous advertising and things that people would be able to understand. And, without working in marketing. Yeah, absolutely. So the two things I try to do. One is make sure it wasn't jargon heavy. Yeah. You know, I always aim for, I'm not sure I always do it, but aim for it should be complex ideas written simply, not simple ideas written complexly. Uh, so I've always tried to keep it very, very simple. Mm. And then the other point is, yeah, it's, it's relevant to lots of different areas. If what you're doing in whatever walk of life it involves trying to persuade other people to do something, yeah. then there'll be stuff in the book that's of, of use. Yeah. Mm. And it's going well? Going very well. Because um, you just won, he's not going to tell you this, but Richard just won. This is amazing when I found out. Uh, if you've been on Twitter the last kind of month or two, you may have seen BBH Labs, which is the advertising agency's, and one of their Twitter feeds, launch this thing called the World Cup of Books, right? which is a bit of a joke, kind of, but alongside the, the Football World Cup. Uh, and they had this kind of playoffs, didn't they? Yeah. And everybody voted for, for books. Tell me some of the books that were in there. So we so had like they, Phil Barber's yeah, book. They, they selected 80 books and then it's a brilliant Twitter feed. So people don't follow BB actually. It's very, very good. So then they use lots of different things like um, ratings, number of time the books appeared on advertising yeah. lists. They selected 32 books. Yeah. And so then put them in group stages and then did the knockouts. And so there were things like Ogilvy and Advertising, uh, decoded by Phil Bard and then that's yeah. become And some of these, these um, are like yeah, really yeah. substantial kind of yeah, they, marketing yeah. books, like pivotal to the yes. industry. I mean, even I accept that maybe, just maybe, Don't you mean too much? thinking fast and slow probably should have won, but that's... Uh, yeah. But I mean, yeah. Tom, Tom's book was in there, sure um, yeah. Byron Sharp, How Brands Grow, which is both yeah. of which are probably here somewhere. Even all the uh, way back to the 1920s, I think uh, Claude Hopkins is probably the oldest book. He's, he's uh, yeah. scientific advertisers on there. Yeah. And you won. Yes. Well, yeah. Some, a few people have pointed out there is something called a recency bias, which I may have it's benefited from. Yeah. If you ever follow those, uh, you know, Q do best albums yeah. ever, you do notice there is a tendency for those lists to overweight recent ones. So Because you're more inclined to go, oh, no, yeah, I've read yeah. that. Yeah. Like, because it's just come out yeah, and it's, it's more fashionable. Okay. Yeah. I and also, I, th I, th I think also the way, sometimes the way people vote is it's not just what they think. There's a bit of, well, how does this reflect on me? Yeah. And I'm not sure if you voted for Claude Hopkins' 1920 book, what, what that says to you about a kind of... Oh, that's uh, the best as an, book, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, th yeah. I think you're being very modest. Anyway, that was amazing. So uh, not only is this a good book, it's just been declared the best book, the best marketing book ever read, ever written, <laughs> potentially, according to VBH and according to... Lots of Richards' his friends yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's get to, back to the science. So, the, yeah. so behavioural science then. Yes. So you were explaining to us before so the difference between behavioural science, behavioural psychology, social psychology, social yeah, science, all these kind of things. So there's, lot, there's this kind of three or four different terms that are used. I would say social psychology is probably the, the best term. And now what people often talk about is behavioural economics, but that is a very 
select, if you're being pedantic, it's a very select group of um, biases. It's essentially where psychology meets economics. Yeah. And then some people use the term behavioural science, which I think is a catch-all subject. Sometimes the danger of using these words behavioural science, behavioural economics, is it makes it feel like it is a recent field, it's only been around 20 or 30 yeah. years. And actually, some of the biases in the book stretch back to the 1890s. Right. Uh, and the danger is if we only focus on things like loss aversion or anchoring, we're ignoring a whole range of biases that I think are equally relevant. Things yeah. like um, the pratfall effect, yeah. which is much less commonly talked about. Yeah. Okay, good. Mm. Uh, so the theory of that, because mm. it's, based, it's based in some science. Yeah. Uh, and some structured principles, not like you kind of invented these, you're taking oh, these no, no, kind no, of no, from, yeah, from yeah, learning. Yeah, so then, then for us, when we talk about, I mean, on Media Snack, we're talking about the industry, we're talking as mm. kind of practitioners, and we're talking to practitioners, people that work in the industry. Yeah. So how do you take this, which is really entertaining, really interesting, fascinating, and the theories of these, how, do, how can a marketer then start to apply them? Because yeah. some of the case studies are, are hugely powerful, in transform transformative in businesses, aren't they? Like yeah. just by changing people's perceptions of things, like yeah. the Nespresso example, yes. things like that. I mean, whole categories created yeah. through think rethinking yeah. category. So, yeah, I, th I think one of the unfair criticisms of the discipline is that this is an academic thing. It's not related to the hard nosed world yeah. of uh, commercialism. But what I've tried to do is, is take some of these uh, existing, as you say, existing theories show by my own experiments and stuff I've done with some colleagues through the years that the biases do affect, proven they do affect commercial brands in the UK. Yeah. And then the bulk of the chapter is, look, now you know this, what should you do differently? Yeah. And it generally affects all areas of marketing. So there is stuff in there that affects uh, web design, there's things that affect TV buying. Mm -hmm. So there's an idea around, I won't go into the experiment, but essentially there's an idea of social proof that popular things become more popular still. If you, if you think something is um, and the norm of behaviour, you're more likely to follow it, whatever people say. Two psychologists, Zhang and Zakhan, took that principle and experimented with TV ads. Mm -hmm. And they showed that if you play a funny TV ad, and sometimes you play it to people on their own, and sometimes you play it to people in groups, yeah. the ad itself, the content itself, is seen as funnier when you're in a group. Yeah. Now that's probably the most implementational buying ID you could get. You know, this is essentially look at your barb data, look at whether your funny ad is, uh, sorry, look at the program choice. Don't yeah. just select your program on conversion to your audience. Also look at whether it's watched in groups. So it's a very, very tactical, easily applicable idea for yeah. marketers. But you can go all the way, another other way to think of, well, there are ideas in there around um, media choice. You know, one I think the fascinating ideas is a guy, Leon Festinger, he talks about the idea of confirmation bias. It's the idea that we interpret messages through a lens of our existing feelings. Yeah. That's a problem because if you don't like a brand, well, whenever you see their message, like a rational message, you will interpret it uh, cynically. Now, what he argues, and again, the experiments are all laid out in the book, he argues the best time to persuade people is when they are distracted because the brains a great ability to come up with counter arguments to maintain mm. its existing point of view because it's distracted that, it, that that ability is limited so therefore you, know, you suddenly come up with a very counterintuitive approach mm. you, you're saying well look don't run i think what most people would do would say okay some people dislike our brand let's persuade them by getting a really high attention moment like say cinema mm. what festinger says is that is absolutely the wrong thing to do what you should be doing is reaching people when they are doing something else. So a medium like radio might be, but yeah. be ideal. So yeah, you've got your buying examples, you've got your media choice examples, and then you've got lots of examples around creative use and, uh, and strategy. Yeah, mm. excellent. Mm. Very good. And you are, uh, this has been so successful so far. Yeah. Everybody says you can't make money out, so of, far, out, yeah. of, out of books. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you've now launched kind of consulting on, off the back of that. So yes. taking some of these principles and going out to businesses and helping them yeah. kind of solve some of their yeah. challenges. So, so I'm, do, I'm doing two things, three days a week, man and Gottlieb, and I look at our head of their behavioural science. So yeah. any clients I'll go and work with on problems they have and how maybe behavioural science can give them a different angle to solve it. And then the other time I have, I'm trying to do four separate things, a bit of speaking, a bit of writing, I want to write a second book, 
but then trying to fund that through doing training for companies or, or, or consulting. Yeah. And so far it's taken me in a, a bizarre set of different directions from talking to people about how you can reduce the chance of uh, youths being attracted to uh, extremist ideologies right. all the way to how can you persuade people that um, to, 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 um, uh, that a price is uh, really good value. Yeah. So a whole range of different areas. Excellent, good. Well, we look forward to that. Excellent. Um, I've just noticed yeah. you're wearing diesel, diesel glasses and a diesel t-shirt. Am I? And I think, yeah. like what Rich has said, it's because he does, he constantly pranks people. He th- people yeah. think that you're pranking them, right? Yeah, because yeah, you, yeah. you yes. set up these scenarios just to show them like, how they make stupid choices. Yeah. I just wonder whether you, I don't know whether I wonder whether you, no, yeah, I, I wonder whether you just dressed head to toe diesel. No, no, no. I, 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 no, no. I, I don't think I've ever been accused of uh, dressing for a psychology experiment. Okay. But uh, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Uh, we did um, t- just quick before we go. T- tell me about the uh, the two of the biases. I think are really interesting. Mm. Let's talk about some of the favourite biases because that's all mm. kind of the meaty stuff. Uh, there's what you call the pratfall effect, yeah. right? Which is the perception that, perf- well, you explain it. Yeah, Perfe- yeah. Perfection is unbelievable. Yes, yeah. So this is uh, 1960s, there was a Can professor of psychology. To David, to David Indo. Yes. Yeah. Perfection is. Uh, <laughs> there's a psychology professor at yeah. Harvard called Elliot Aronson. And he runs this experiment where he recruits a colleague, uh, gives him the answers to a quiz, sets him off and records him while he's uh, taking part in this quiz. And the contestant, because he had the answer for, and gets 92% of the questions right, so he wins the quiz by miles. Yeah. But then as he's stepping up to leave, he makes what the Americans call a pratfall, a small blunder. So he stands up and spills a, coffee, a cup of coffee down himself. Aronson takes that recording and he plays it to people in one of two variants. Either they hear the entire incident, great quiz answering and mistake, or just the great quiz question answering. Mm. And he then asks people, how appealing do you think that contestant is? And people are significantly more likely to find the contestant appealing if they've heard the mistake as well. So Aronson calls this the pratfall effect, the idea that if you exhibit a flaw, you become more appealing. You should call it the Boris Johnson effect. Boris Boris, Boris, I think is a a brilliant example of that. And I think he's also a brilliant example because one of the variants of Aronson's uh, experiment was he also got the contestant to do really badly on purpose. He gets 35% of the questions right. In that scenario, people preferred him when they didn't hear the coffee incident. So it's it's an an effect that if you are seen as competent and you've got skills, a weakness makes you more appealing. If you are seen as incompetent and you make another mistake, you're seen worse. So I wonder if Boris Johnson, whether you like him or not, he's obviously a highly intelligent man and he's quoting ancient Greek to us. Um, I think maybe they, his mistakes is a very clever way of harnessing the practical effect. Mm. But, other, but other advertisers have done it. So you go through the history of advertising and it's amazing. If you think about some of the best ever campaigns, mm. at the heart of them is the admission of a mistake yeah. or admission of a flaw. You know, um, Guinness, good things come to those who wait. Yeah. Listerine, the taste you hate twice a day. Avis, we're no, number two, so yeah. try harder. Uh, VW, ugly is only skin deep. Again and again, the best advertisers have yeah. recognised admit a flaw and therefore be seen as yeah. believable. Admit a flaw and it makes your other strengths that yeah. much more powerful. And that's, that, that, yeah. that's so powerful because if it's like a human truth, isn't it? That's why it's mm. beautiful that we apply it to politicians because we just know that the over-polished becomes untrustworthy yes. and the flaws, you know, in, if you watch House of Cards, you know, they kind of like des- almost design the, fl- the flaw, you know, the, and the confession and the, the redemption of a politician, you know, back to... Uh, to, to being trustworthy, yeah, you know, yeah. because the public then have some sympathy. Yes. Well, I think that you often use that. I'm not sure if the politicians or kind of celebrity, they tall, tall poppy syndrome. We like, you know, like to cut people down. Well, maybe the way to get around that, rather than being too big for your boots, is to admit a weakness and therefore, yeah, yeah, uh, feel a bit more. So, what, what's your favourite bias then? Oh, from, so from, from the book. So, so, from the book, it would be the pratfall effect. And the reason I love it is this kind of second angle to it, which is, look, you've got this academic evidence that we've talked about, Elliot Aronson. Mm. You've got this case study evidence. Um, You've also got real world evidence. There's a wonderful study by Northwestern University, which shows reviews, uh, if they are more than 4.5 out of five, Mm. they actually become less effective than lower reviews. So you've got all this evidence, yet when I've gone and looked at like a weekend's worth of papers, the, the number of 
brands that use this is vanishingly small. Yeah. And the argument I make in the book is that it's an example of what's called the principal agent problem, that there is a divergence of, inter uh, of interests between the principal, uh, that is the brand or the shareholders, yeah. and the, the employee, the marketer. And because what's in, in the interest of the brand is long-term profitable growth, and the yeah. practical effect is amazing for that. Yeah. What's in the interest for the marketer, yes, it is long-term profitable growth, but it's also safe career progression. Mm -hmm. And the argument I make is that actually the practical effect is not good for safe career progression. Yeah. So paradoxically, because of selfish motivations of, of, of employees, the practical effect will be a rarely used bias and therefore, if you can persuade the people you're working with about the merits of behavioural science, this will always be a distinctive approach. Yeah. And we know, one of the main things we know is that distinctiveness is memorable. So it will always be a, a, a very powerful bias. Brilliant. It's good. Yeah. Okay, uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming in. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, if you haven't read it, go and grab a copy of The Choice Factory. I think the best book ever written, apparently, <laughs> uh, according to Twitter. Uh, but that's it. See you on next Media Snack Meets.